Dr. A.B. Mehta is a pioneer of interventional cardiology in India. With over 61 years of experience, he is the director of the cardiology department at Jaslok Hospital in Mumbai, India. Dr. Mehta has performed over 35,000 angioplasties and over 75,000 angiographies, making him one of the most experienced and interventional cardiologists in the country. He specializes in coronary interventions, rotablation, balloon valvotomy, and transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Dr. Mehta's contributions to cardiology in India are significant. He introduced cardiac catheterization, angiography in newborn babies, and bundled electrography in 1973. He also led the first systematic trial on primary angioplasty in acute myocardial infarction. Dr. Mehta has been part of several multinational and multi-center clinical trials on stent evaluation and drug eluting stents. His expertise and dedication have earned him several prestigious awards, including the Padma Shri by Government of India in 2004 and the Maharashtra Gaurav Award for the most outstanding contribution in cardiology from the Government of Maharashtra in 2004. Hello everyone, today we have Dr. A.B. Mehta, who is an interventional cardiologist, director at Jaslok Hospital and Research Centre, Mumbai. Hello sir, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. So, to start this thing off, your father was a lawyer. You became a cardiologist and one of the very best at that. And even the government of India awarded you the civilian honour of the Padma Shri in 2004. Tell us about this career-defining journey. Very honestly, uh, I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. And um, but my father's ambition was, his own ambition was to be a doctor. But unfortunately, due to so many restraints, including finances, he could never become a doctor. And he went and became a lawyer by default. But he kept on expressing his ambition that I wish you become a doctor. And he saw and he was projecting his own ambition in me. And uh, I was very much attached to my dad. Okay. And therefore, it, I, it occurred to me that I should make a mission, that I should fulfill my father's ambition. So I became a doctor. Okay. And <clears throat> yes, so... Um, uh, it was not very easy to become a, to 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 procure admission in medical college in my days, maybe even now. So um, uh, studied hard, studied in uh, sometimes very adverse circumstances. Brought up in a lower middle class society because uh, my father's income was at that point of time when I was studying was um, very meager and sufficient to live almost like hand to mouth but very supportive both my parents were and then very encouraging and then when um, I secured 83 percent marks in what we used to call an SSC board examination at that point of time got a very easy admission in Elphinstone College and from there to GS Medical College and then um, I was a very smart Examining, I knew the pulse of examiner and uh, how to lead them to ask me what I wanted them to ask me. And um, so I had a, a luckily and uh, fortunately very brilliant academic career, secured 19 gold medals at, up to MD level. and. Uh, then nothing succeeds like success. So it kept on happening in my life. All fortunate experiences, fortunate accidents kept on happening in my life. And uh, that helped me to build my career. Okay. So talking about like you were close to your father. So were you actually living out his dream? Say that again. Say he wanted to become a doctor. Yeah. But he was unfortunate and he couldn't like succeed in becoming a doctor. Right. So were you living out his dream or like were you living his dream for him? Yes and no both. The moment I went to the medical college, 
I got so deeply interested into the subject of biology, human biology, that um, I was driven by curiosity, inquisitiveness, and uh, so uh, experienced a great happiness in studying medicine. Apart from that, uh, I was very ambitious. So ambition drives you to very hard work. The ambition to stay at the top drives you not only to hard work, but sometimes anxiety and uh, stress, everything. Well, it was okay. Uh, it was uh, because I was getting rewarded for all my efforts, stress, anxiety, and everything, and I enjoyed. So, it, it, after entering the medical college, it was just not merely fulfilling the dream of my dad, but then achieving my own. And there are inspiring facts also. One day, um, while I was in first MBBS, I read Swami Vivekananda's speech in Chicago. And I was awfully impressed. That thereafter, I took up a slogan, Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. And that I would put it uh, every... I put it in such a convenient... Uh, at, a, at, a, at such a place where I would be able to read it uh, every now and then. So just in front of my bed, in my bedroom. Arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached. And that was a driving force. He, he was a mentor. Swami Vivekananda. Yes. So, now talking about to stop not till the goal is reached. So, could you add some more layers to that goal? Have you reached that goal? Are you still striving for it? See, the goal is a moving target. Okay, so it keeps moving on. When you, when you achieve one goal, you're looking for another, then you're looking for another one. And the man without a goal has lost his pathway. Goal has to be there. And also, it is not the goal alone, but how you achieve. What kind of means you employ to achieve the goal. A man wants to become a multi-millionaire, but if he's a smuggler, the goal is achieved, but the means are wrong. In, um, so, uh, when you read about the life of such great people like Mahatma Gandhi, Vivekananda and all, you get truly in, inspired in a sublime way. The pathway should be sublime, socially acceptable, rewarding, both to you and the society. That's very insightful, sir. So now, since you've mentioned this, so are you, like when you say the move, the goal is a moving target. Yes. So I think you've been setting higher benchmarks for yourself in the number of years that you've been in the practice of cardiology. So like, could you like share your experiences on that? Okay. Fortunately, the medicine is a, a dynamic science. All sciences are dynamic. Uh, even that way, economics is also a dynamic science. I'm not denying that. But medicine, a biological science, has challenges, and there is never a monotony. Years ago, when I was treating heart attack patients, to, to give you an example, a um, very famous uh, musician, Lakshmikant Pyaralal. Okay. Pyaralal Bhai was admitted when I was a junior house physician in KM Hospital and he came with a severe penicillin shock. Okay. And he was literally pulseless. And whole night and day I stayed with him because we did not have monitors. Okay. We did not have gadgets. All that I have to do is to record his blood pressure every five minutes, ten minutes by myself manually. But I pulled him out. I pulled him out of that crisis. He was not such a big man at that point of time that he, he then he was designed to become and then he became. And um, But now, uh, 
I kept on saying that at that point of time, heart attack patients were treated by only to an expectant met, matter, um, uh, manner. Uh, what it means is that um, if there are any complications, treat them. Otherwise, allow the heart attack to heal by itself. Today, a man comes with an acute heart attack. Uh, I can reverse the heart attack if I have an opportunity to treat in time. Uh, a man with a blocked artery, which is responsible for the heart attack, like coronary artery is blocked and he comes with chest pain and we see he's got a heart attack. And if I have an opportunity to restore the blood supply within a matter of hour, then the heart attack uh, reverses. Like uh, the muscles which are part of the heart, muscles which are injured, uh, they can be uh, brought back to life. You think so, this is a complete reversal? Yes. The recovery is, it has been found that those people who get an acute heart attack, millions of cells get injured. Millions of muscle cells are getting injured, heart muscle cells are getting injured, but they are not dead. So therefore, they can be revived provided they are supplied with the nutrition again, and that's the blood. So if I open up the artery, and restore the blood flow to that injured muscles, they will slowly spring back to life. So much so that some patients, almost 33% of the patients, who at the end of three months, you will not find even a trace of heart attack. That they ever got heart attack. The heart is completely recovered. So this change which I have noticed is uh, very gratifying, very rejoicing. And at every stage of development, which I had an experience to go through has uh, inspired me to do better and better for myself and for my patients. So coming back to this, I just want to know, like when you say it reverses completely, I, you, and you've mentioned a figure of 33%, the impact of long COVID on patients who have CVDs. See, um, when COVID came, SARS, covid we were not knowing anything about it. Absolutely. Nobody okay. knew nothing. And uh, it's an American way of saying nobody knew nothing. <laughs> two, two negatives making one positive. But um, anyway, so uh, we, were, um, we were also groping in the dark. And then we realized a few things. First of all, the, the natural instinct of protecting your own self while offering treatment to a COVID patient is obvious. So anything that would require close contact, like angioplasty, which is a, a, a really an anchor sheet, or I think the best treatment to a patient who comes with a heart attack, we could not offer. We were to an extent scared. So we would use uh, clot busting medications, uh, what we call in medical terms thrombolysis. And uh, those were inferior so the patient did receive inferior quality of treatment. Patients themselves were scared to go to the hospital. And that is because they would come in contact with the COVID atmosphere. Thirdly, those people who already had pre-existing heart disease, which they were not aware of, COVID did to some extent precipitated the actual heart attack. And therefore they were driven to the hospital and also you know that there is a condition called COVID myocarditis. Yes, the muscles of the heart are uh, affected by COVID and they become weak. And that sometimes, although primarily COVID was a respiratory, respiratory disease. disease. But it did occur that some patients did get the heart involvement and that's how it happened. Now, um, also uh, we knew that the uh, uh, there could be an incidence of a uh, few actual clotting in the coronary arteries, cases of clotting in the coronary arteries causing heart attack. It could happen that way, but is I don't think it's clearly documented. Yes. So this is the situation about COVID. The, the new wave that has come now recently, uh, fortunately seems to be a milder one. And the reason that this uh, clinical expression is mild 
may be due to that uh, a vast majority of us, the population is vaccinated, vaccinated. Okay. and had exposure. Or maybe this is mutated, so it's mild one. So, no, the thing with uh, COVID has been over the years, from the time it, like, uh, the pandemic hit us, the situation has been that it's an ever-evolving thing. It's mutating all the time. Yes. And the symptoms are different and it's impacting different people differently. The people who are above the age of 65, 70, the expression of COVID morbidity and even mortality is much higher. So how did you traverse this pandemic? If you could shed some light on it, like what were the challenges oh, I've, and what I've, did you do to like, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you must be accustomed to a way of life, like coming to the hospital, ch uh, treating patients, interacting with them. Despite the fact that materially we are growing. Now, for example, um, the computers, the internet, they were su supposed to make uh, us much more efficient. But efficiency does not consistently correlate with happiness. And we are not machines. We have emotions. So we are human beings, live. So stress factor is growing very rapidly. Competition, uh, that is one. Two, that the, I think, uh, Governments should do a lot more than what so far they have done, and that's regarding use of tobacco, smoking. That I think, uh, of course, significantly reduced. In my opinion, we see less more, uh, much less smoking than we used to see in the past. The third thing is that uh, the genetic factors. Now, you, if you were to ask me, if I were to uh, assess a young man who has come with a heart attack. What are the two important factors which have contributed for higher incidence of uh, people below the age of 40 to have heart attacks, like is uh, family history and cigarettes. These two are very, very important contributory factor for premature heart attacks. So you mentioned that the government should do a lot more in regards to reduction. Tobacco production. That's so not banned. But that is not banned, sir. And the other thing is, it is a luxury good and it, I mean, a lot of taxes are collected on the basis of that and the world runs on economics. It's an interesting question. Um, the blocked coronary arteries um, is a very important contributor to heart attack and death. Um, the commonest cause of death after the age of 50 is heart attack and the commonest cause of death below the age of 50 is accident. So heart attack is number one killer. Now when we demonstrated way back in 1912, the scientist pathologist showed that when he did the autopsy and postmortem, the people with heart attack he found that he found a clot in the coronary artery. So then, so now the cause is known. Thereafter, the clot does not occur overnight. What happens is that over a period of time, deposition of uh, cholesterol, fat material, onto the lumen of the coronary artery leads to the narrowing of coronary artery. And, and sometimes this uh, soft plaque of uh, cholesterol, fatty material, ruptures. And a block which was about 20-30% becomes 100% in a matter of few hours and produces heart attack. If we were to detect these blocks in time and treat them, then we are uh, making a great progression in prevention of heart attack or postponement, if I can't say prevention, postponement at least. So in 19, uh, somewhere around... Uh, 65 or 70, when the angiography was discovered, um, we started knowing the blocks, severity, extent, degree, the number of blocks and whatnot. And then we then 
found a treatment. In 1969, the bypass surgery was discovered to bypass those blocks and so therefore sustain the circulation despite the blocks, the bypass surgery. And in 1977, uh, we realized that the bypass surgery is not a panacea because it, the recurrence takes place because coronary disease is an aging process. So the bypass grafts get, got blocked or the new blocks came in. So uh, we wanted uh, some alternate solution or alternate medicine. So there, there they came the option of angioplasty. Uh, Andreas Grunzig, who came to our hospital way back in 1981, uh, was a discoverer of angioplasty in Zurich. And uh, so this came as an option to uh, bypass surgery to remove the blocks. Now, people are now aware the moment they get discomfort in the chest and they re-experience and then they reconfirm that yes, it occurs when I walk briskly and when I do a strenuous work. So I must see a doctor, doctor makes a diagnosis, uh, non-invasive methods like ECG, echo, stress test, CT and geography, the blocks are found and therefore they are promptly treated. That is how uh, we have been able to reduce the number of heart attacks, uh, which would have otherwise been several times bigger number than what we have today. And um, so the angioplasty, angiography are in a way, if I can't say confidently preventive, at least postponing the heart attack. And we, you know very well, you cannot prevent it's an aging process. So number of angiographies, angioplasties is a, it's a good uh, welcome uh, finding that the, the people are realizing to go to doctors in time and the doctors are offering the treatment. So and talking about like introduction of uh, newer procedures, you yourself have introduced a few procedures early on in your career, if you could. Uh, well, I think um, uh, in 1974, uh, I had my colleague Dr. Munshi who had come from Velour. And both of us together developed the angiography here. And um, some of the inter interesting uh, incidences, if I were to narrate, Viju Patnaik, uh, he came from Delhi to get his angiography done here. I think it's Navin Patnaik's dad. And he was a very, very strong man. Viju Patnaik is Navin Patnaik's dad. Yeah. So uh, he came and uh, I came to see him. And uh, I explained to him that I would be uh, puncturing the groin mm -hmm. after local anesthesia. And he told me that you don't have to use local anesthesia. There is no need. Puncture, I don't worry about it. Do it straight away. He was such a bold man. And uh, he, he said that no, no need for puncture. And he insisted that I do it without any anesthesia locally. So in 74, we developed in geography. Then in 1988, uh, we developed angioplasty just look hospital. And the first very widely, uh, I mean, very systematically organized uh, workshop was held in just look 88. There we had, had invited Dr. Jerry Doros from Milwaukee and he demonstrated 23 cases of angioplasty in three days, and that's how we picked it up. In seven, 2002, May, uh, I used the first drug eluting stand in the country. Okay. Yes, uh, sir. In, in a lawyer, Supreme Court lawyer. And uh, I'm not alone, but the people from various parts of the country were working together, and uh, we were exchanging thoughts, deliberations, at the various meetings and collectively uh, the growth of uh, cardiology took place in India. So now talking about angiographies and angioplasties, you've done thousands of these procedures. If you, if I have to ask you to put a number to it, could you put a number to it? Because well, I don't I've know. Lost, I've lost the count to be very honest with you, but it could be close to about uh, 100,000. Because I was working in two hospitals, Sion Hospital and Just Look Hospitals. So, so in Sion Hospital, the work volume was very large. And apart from that, I used to go and do a demonstration of angioplasties in the uh, country as a proctor. And also outside the country, I did uh, proctoring in China. 
uh, way back in 1993. So I've lost the count to be honest with you, but uh, surely it's a very, very large number. Uh, elderly people have much more disease of, uh, and blockages in coronaries than the younger people. Now, um, so I think um, between, I would say uh, between uh, 70 to 90, there was almost 200% rise in the coronary. Thereafter, probably awareness and the health consciousness uh, was responsible for this. These factors were responsible for stabilizing the incidence of heart attack. And I, I think uh, currently we have we are fairly uh, doing fairly well in uh, postponement or prevention of heart disease. And so, if you could just uh, add some more to it by co commenting on how is this procedure preventing further CVD complications? You see, um, it's like this. Uh, the people who have heart attack, their heart is damaged. So the normal pumping action required to sustain circulation is uh, uh, not there. And people who have a, 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 a much more severe damage to the heart muscle, the heart eventually fails to maintain the circulation of the body, which we call in medical parlance as heart failure. This is, uh, in the common man's language, heart failure means uh, stoppage of heart, but that's not so in the medical parlor. Heart failure means inability of the heart to cope up with the demand of the body. And um, this complication occurs after the heart is damaged by heart attack. So that morbidity can be prevented. Also, there are certain valve diseases uh, which put stress. For example, uh, aortic valve is a valve which controls the blood flow from the main pumping chamber of the heart called left ventricle to the main pipe of the body called aorta. Now it works one way. It allows the blood to go from the heart into the body but doesn't allow to come back. The valve closes. Okay. So that's called aortic valve. So the narrowing of aortic valve, which also is an aging process, um, uh, produces a lot of stress on the heart and the heart fails. Fortunately, now the treatment for that is available. And uh, uh, we are able to offer this treatment. So they, 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 besides improving the quality, the quantity of life also improves. The durability of life, expectancy is also improved. So this way, if you treat the heart disease in time, you prevent morbidity. And if you prevent morbidity, quality of life is better and also the quantity of life is better. So just one thing, if you could add to this, like some symptoms which we overlook on a day-to-day -day basis, some symptoms that could be an indication of a CVD. First of all, let's talk about the myth. Absolutely. People have wrong idea that the heart attack pain should be very severe. No. That it should be situated in the left side. Mm. It comes from movies. <laughs> okay. You see, you see, you see Dharmendra suddenly sees his mother's uh, dead body. I mean, in the movie. So, and he, and and he collapses with the severe pain or whatever it is. That doesn't happen in reality. The very often, more often in fact, the pain or discomfort is mild. It may not be necessarily pain, it may be just constriction or heaviness in the chest. The pain need not be on the left side of the chest, it can be all over the chest more commonly. Sometimes it may be only in jaw, sometimes it may be in both arms. My uh, suggestion or my advice to those people who are in vulnerable age, that is after 40 or 45, and who have some risk factors like diabetes, cigarette smoking, or family history, if any odd discomfort which they have not experienced before, before occurs on the trunk, that means from shoulder to upper abdomen, okay. then they should uh, not neglect it and consult a doctor. Thank you, sir. And so, if uh, you mentioned this, so I'm just asking, you've referred to Dharvendra a couple of times. 
in this in the course of this in uh, discussion with me so are you a dharmendra fan by any chance or uh, uh-huh. um is an is a very good actor and okay. uh, he is a very very well accomplished in his uh, profession uh, i just gave off an example <laughs> So, yeah. would you care to say who your favorite actor is as well? My favorite actor, Amitabh Bachchan. Okay. So, how has cardiac care evolved over the years? And I would want you to comment from the time you've started till where you are currently. Okay, let us say a significant start. Okay? Yes. Nineteen sixty-five, the first ICCU intensive care unit. was established at KEM hospital under the leadership of late Dr K K Date and high happened to be the ICCU registrar registrar means the 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 house physician the local and why was this why icu was needed <coughs> the sudden death the commonest cause of sudden death is due to cardiac arrest cardiac arrest and that cardiac arrest are two types stoppage of activity or fibrillary activity fibrillary activity means the heart contracts at the rate of 400 there is hardly any time to fill up or hardly any time to empty so it is as good as a cessation of circulation complete and um, that could be treated by an electric shock and the heart springs back to life so therefore what happened is that unless you treat the heart attack and cardiac arrest in 4 minutes of time irreversible brain damage takes place so the responsibility was to detect in 4 minutes of time and since the treatment became available by an shock by giving a shock we must detect in time and deliver the shock in time to prevent the damage occurring from sudden cardiac arrest so the icu took birth then came the pacemakers if the rhythm is very slow we used to put pacemaker temporary pacemaker i had to put in late jay prakash nara and while they wanted to when he came here in our hospital and they wanted to make a fistula for him and so the pacemakers then uh, came uh, bypass surgery in 1969 the dr donald effler started the bypass surgery in united states in cleveland clinic and that became a, a very very important uh, step forward in the treatment of heart disease coronary heart disease then came an angioplasty and uh, then we started treating the valves by percutaneous method without opening the chest so so on and so forth is going on so and uh, you were the first uh, cardiologist to introduce a drug eluting stent so if you could comment on what are the newer innovations in drug eluting stents and what are your views on indian made stents compared to foreign made stents okay so the initial drug eluting stents uh, the platform there is a drug and there is a platform those that platforms were thick they were made up of stainless steel now we make it uh, the stents are being made from cobalt chromium which is a thin material and it is non irritant so it does not create inflammatory reaction the quality of drug uh, the 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 um, the pharmacological agents that we use are, are very superior with less side effects then the 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 drug has to remain on to the stent for certain period of time so the release mechanism we have developed uh, uh, certain advances in that also and uh, so that how the drugs are the, the drug eluting stents of current generation are um, far far superior in performance as compared to the previous generation and uh, you asked me about the indian in instance i think to... without any bias or prejudice i should say indian uh, device companies are performing phenomenally well the stands are approved at international level they are being used in number of other countries the outside india and uh, i think they are very very comparable to any international 
Stand so coming back to your life, um, if I am not wrong, I am still verifying this. You have an experience over 57 years in the field of cardiology. You have performed over 75,000 angiographies and over 18,000 angioplasties. I want you to share your experience about this. And if you can recall, you've given me a couple of scenarios wherein the number of surgeries and the people you have treated, but anything that was very complex or something that just springs to your mind? I'll tell you a few examples uh, uh, which are in my memory and led to very pleasantly. One was that it was at Dashera. And in, you know that in uh, uh, Hindu society, Dashera is a very, very important festival which you want to spend with your family. And it so happened that I got a frantic phone call from Sion Hospital that one 32-year-old gentleman has sustained a heart attack. And uh, they wanted me to go there. My re resident doctor wanted me to go to Sion Hospital and offer angioplasty there. So I said, why don't you op offer? He said, no, sir, he's very young and I think it's complex. So and, and I'm not feeling confident. So somewhat unwillingly, uh, I went there. And uh, I found that the machine was not working. So I called up uh, Philip's people and uh, convinced them that this is a life in connection with the life of a very young man. And when I went there, there was a, a Muslim lady who was in hijab and with two kids she was holding. And uh, they were, uh, both the kids were hungry, it looked like, because they were crying and uh, and they were had a, a piece of biscuit in their hands. So, and the, the lady was totally ignorant. Her husband was the patient and he was a hawker, a day-to-day -day earner. And um, so I somehow managed to do a plasty, call the people, got the machine repaired, and they, I could uh, offer him, uh, I should say, salvage from that heart attack. And um, the happiness that I saw in the family, like the wife and uh, the two kids, they were all uh, very, very happy. And that, I think, was the most rewarding uh, event. And that was the happiest year of my life. So and, and many a times we come across cases in which uh, uh, the complication takes place and sometimes even mortality. And then uh, I have to prepare myself as to how to break the news. And that also requires a tact because uh, what we do many a times is that uh, when something goes wrong during the procedure, uh, one member of my team goes out and alerts the family that the things are not moving as good as we wanted to. And, but the doctors are working on it. So um, because um, we have not only to treat with the disease, but also with the emotions, the family members we have to interact with. So all these things are sometimes uh, challenging. So you mentioned about this Dashara incident. Just going back to it, you said you were a bit reluctant because you wanted to spend time with family. Yes. So in such scenarios, like wherein, like say, you are done with your time, with the time that you are supposed to spend per patient or at the hospital, say according to your shift, and there is something complex that comes up and then you have to work on that, like you have to perform a surgery or something that is very complex and it exceeds your time. So how do you condition the mind to, because there is no room for error here. Yes. Yeah. So if you're reluctant to do it and you want to just get done with it, there are chances of error increasing. So the only available artery was carotid artery. And that uh, we did. Uh, we were supported by the surgeon. And the surgeon exposed the artery for us and then we did. And um, it, it, it helped him a lot. But eventually, I, he also had uh, kidney problems. So all these things put together uh, was making a very challenging uh, clinical situation. And uh, some other we 
we are happy to offer a successful you know, trans uh, catheter valve replacement. So now, just moving ahead and towards the conclusion of this interaction with me, I have three questions for you. These are rapid fire questions, so you just have to go straight okay. on. Okay, so the first question is, which one habit should people strictly refrain from to have a healthy heart? I would say that that would not be an appropriate question for the single that I think it's a summary of your lifestyle. So, uh, like, uh, there are two uh, important non-correctable factors, aging and the family history. So, we may not talk about that because... Uh, Family history is something which you've inherited and you can't reverse it. And aging is also, we are mortal, so aging has to happen. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that insightful thought. Thank you so much.